our next speaker um, this afternoon is Derek Bristol, who I will say on our first caving trip together got pulled over by a Wyoming state trooper. Um, anyway, uh, Derek is a caver from Denver, Colorado. He has been involved in exploration, survey, and cartography of Wechigia Caves since 2010. Derek is also active in many other survey projects around the US and Mexico. In addition to these survey projects, he is also an inspiring cave videographer and has created over 170 short films that include tutorials on caving techniques, caving gear reviews, and videos that document cave trips and, and expeditions across the world. Um, with that being said, Derek, I uh, will hand over the floor to you. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, recent discoveries, and uh, recent is a relative term uh, re relative to the 35-year exploration history of Lechuguilla. Uh, these are things that have happened in the last seven or eight years. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, things I've been involved in in the West Branch, and those, those discoveries are Oz and Zion. So uh, you've seen a lot of different maps of the cave already today. Uh, there, there's, uh, I think you're all aware, there's three main branches. Um, I've done, ex I've been on expeditions in, in all three branches, but um, most of my project work is focused in the West Branch, which is in red there. Um, and so I'm going to uh, talk about that. Um, so the first, first one is, uh, is uh, Oz, and I'm going to give a little background on uh, uh, how we kind of came about Oz, because everything we find and discover in the cave is sort of built on a foundation of previous discoveries. Um, the, the discovery of Oz goes back uh, a long way, but uh, the history I'm most aware of is uh, starts with John Lyles in 2007. Uh, and John talked earlier about the discovery of Emerald City. Um, and I think this, I don't think he mentioned it, but I, uh, what I recall is that he was following up on a lead from Ray Keeler and looking around this area near the spinning room, which is, uh, is only about 20 minutes travel from Leaning Tower in the Western Borehole or, or Jackpot. Um, and uh, made this Emerald City discovery. And uh, there were, um, he, he showed a few photos of that and some of the large passages in Emerald City. And at the far end of that discovery is Kansas Twister, this large dome that they uh, shot laser distos up in and figured was at least 200 feet high. And there were exploratory climbs that uh, John and James talked a little bit about uh, done in 2007, 2008, and 2010 that led them to climb to the top of um, a large natural bridge that spans the lower part of Kansas Twister. And that's when I got involved in Lechuguilla. I was first invited into the cave by John in 2010. And uh, the photo on the left there is the bottom of Kansas Twister. So it starts off as a roughly 45 degree slope with a big talus cone coming down out of it. Um, and that goes up for 125 vertical feet. And the photo on the right is Janice Tucker, myself in 2010, uh, on my first day in the cave, we went out there to collect some mineral samples under a science permit. And uh, it was the first time I got to have a look at it. This was about a month before a planned expedition in 2010 where there was an effort made to make some progress in the dome, but they, did, they didn't get very far due to poor rock quality. Um, but it kind of got, got me thinking about it um, these hypogene caves like Lechuguilla um, are a little different. If you've um, caved in the east, uh, these caves are quite different in that you can be in really large passage and it'll shut down to a small body size hole and you go through that and it opens up into a big area again. The passage size and connectivity is not consistent and so you have to sort of check under every rock and, and push every hole, whether it's in the floor or the ceiling, uh, to see you know, to find new discoveries. And this uh, seemed to me at the time to be easily the best lead in the cave. It was 30 foot diameter hole going straight up. Uh, obviously it's a technical challenge, but you don't have very many 30 foot diameter leads in much gear these days. So um, I, I was interested in it in 2010 and I, I didn't get to come back until uh, 2012. Uh, 2012, I led an expedition. This was my second expedition to the cave. A uh, team of 10 people here. Uh, John Lyles was along. Uh, it was first um, expedition with James Hunter, 
uh, who's the eight foot tall person on the, towards the left there. And uh, James and I uh, teamed up to do this climb. We hadn't climbed together. I think we'd done one cave trip together briefly just prior to this expedition. Um, but uh, we've done a lot of climbs since then. So a little bit about Kansas Twister itself. You've seen a couple photos already today. This is a photo looking up at, from the, the top of that talus slope. So this is, uh, you could consider this at the 125 foot level uh, looking up. And it's from this point where you can shoot a disto up and get readings of around 200 feet. Uh, you can see the natural bridge up there that the rope is rigged to. Uh, that's about 80 feet above the where the floor is here, where the photo was taken. Um, and uh, James and I found that um, this is a phreatic dome as, as the domes in Lechuguilla are. So they typically aren't these uh, nice vertical shaft Vados domes that you're used to in the Eastern US. Uh, they tend to twist and turn. Um, I've been asked before about whether it's one pit or multiple or one dome or multiple domes. And kind of my way of answering that is if you drop a rock from the top, it'll hit the bottom. So. I consider it one dome, but it does twist and turn, so the, the name's sort of appropriate. Um, after we reached the top, after five days of climbing and surveyed, surveyed it, um, from the base of the talus there to the top is 410 vertical feet. And if you go to the bottom of the talus, it's 535 feet. So at the time, anyway, it was the highest um, technical dome climb that had been done in the US or, or the Western Hemisphere. Um, and we, um, on the last day of the climb, the, which was our sixth day in the cave, uh, was when we discovered Oz. And on the final day of the expedition, final survey day of the expedition, we, we mapped 3,800 feet up there between two teams, uh, which was uh, the most, not the most survey that's been done in Lech in a day. Uh, I think it might've been the third or fourth most. Um, but when you consider the early days when uh, travel times were a lot shorter, and leads were a lot more open. Um, it was a pretty big accomplishment. We, um, I think, uh, yeah, so, so maybe the third or fourth largest uh, survey total um, ever in the biggest survey day in over 20 years, I think at the time. Uh, I think you saw this photo earlier. Uh, James talked a little bit about the climb and I think uh, John touched on it as well. I won't go into detail, but uh, this is a ledge. It's about hundred feet off the floor. Uh, Sean Thomas and James there, um, one of the one of the ledges along the way. So um, fortunately, the climb was sort of broken up, and there are sort of sections that you can do. We did a mix of direct aid climbing, and, and James talked a lot about uh, uh, how we use specialized um, we use tri cams and uh, things like link cams and so on for gear placements. And as a last resort, we'll hand drill bolts. I think we ended up. Uh, hand drilling 15 bolts over the five days, so about three bolts a day. Um, most of the climbing was made, protect, was protected with uh, uh, pitons and nuts and cams. Um, and we did some uh, direct, climb, direct aid climbing on hooks. Um, but uh, anyway, this was one of the, and then used natural anchors whenever they were available. Um, but we were also able to do a fair amount of um, free climbing and we used a few rope tricks. This is a, an upper natural bridge that's about 140 feet off the ground. And we were able to do a rope toss over this and tie off the other end of the rope and then ascend up to the top of the natural bridge. Uh, once you get to the top there, you can transition in, into free climbing mode. And we were able to do a little bit of free climbing in a few sections. This is one of those. Um, so you can transition to sort of some steep ledges and, uh, and make some progress that way. Uh, I think this, James showed this photo earlier. This is um, Roger Harris. Um, as we transition from uh, the Capitan formation, which is uh, massive limestone up into the, the back reef and the rock quality gets a lot, uh, a lot worse when you get up into the back reef. This is um, pretty loose and crumbly rock. Um, and at first look, it's pretty blank. There's, there's no cracks, either vertical or horizontal cracks. And uh, sort of James taught me the technique of probing around with a nut tool until you find a soft pocket of clay and then sort of excavate um, that pocket until you can get a cam into it and then use that for protection. Um, this particular pitch, I think, took four or five bat hooks where you drill a shallow quarter inch hole and then hammer the hook in, um, which is a body weight only type placement. 
when we got to the top, we surveyed um, a couple obvious side passages and it was getting late. We were considering going back to camp um, and we decided to check this one last lead. And this, there's a small hole behind, behind me there and there's a little blue flag that's hanging. And we took a break before we surveyed this. And as we're sitting there eating, we could see that blue flag sort of um, flapping back and forth, not, not vigorously, but a little bit. And that's, um, so there was obviously airflow coming through that little hole. And there's not a whole lot of airflow in Lechuguilla these days since they put the airlock on in the early 2000s. Um, it's really um, uh, quieted the air. So when you see signs of airflow like that's uh, usually a good indicator. Uh, James on point sort of pushed through this um, breakdown collapse. It's sort of, sort of the edge of a talus slope and uh, uh, we surveyed through and on, the, and on the far side, we came out into this very unexpected void. Um, really echoey, big booming um, reverberations from our, from our yelling. Uh, we were pretty excited about this. This was pretty late in the day and this photo this photo is taken with a pretty bright flash you can barely make out you probably can't make out the ceiling in this we couldn't we couldn't really see the ceiling ourselves even with um, bright led lights it took us several tries to get a disto reading from the slope there to the ceiling and it, we got a reading of around 220 feet uh, so we were um, really elated uh, so this this area we later uh, named Oz, sort of following the naming theme that started with Emerald City and Kansas Twister. And uh, when you get through that uh, talus constriction and you get to the bottom of that talus slope, uh, this is, you know, again, 220 feet below the ceiling. Um, we started to survey our way up. This is on the following day, the last day of that expedition. Um, we were surveying, uh, you can see I've got the book out there and it's set four and a half by seven inch paper and I was sketching it uh, 50 feet to the inch and I think after one shot the um, K went off the page because uh, the ceiling was so high. But this is at the top of that talus slope. Um, to the two survey teams that were up there that day, uh, Brian Kendrick took the photo but um, um, and John Lyles is not there either but uh, so there were, were eight of us up there that day and uh, you see lots of smiles on people's faces. This is uh, the big borehole that's up there. Um, it sits about uh, 800 feet above the Western borehole, which is where the camp is. So the camp's about a thousand feet vertically below the entrance. And then you climb 800 vertical feet back up to get up into Oz. And you can see the bedded limestone, which is atypical for most of Lechuguilla. Most of the big passages in Lech are in the um, Capitan. It's a, they call a massive formation, I guess. It's, it's not bedded limestone. It, there's no bedding plains, but up in the back reef, there are these uh, bedded layers and you can see a lot of red corrosion residue. Um, and uh, you can see, um, so this, this passage is about eight to 900 feet long. It averages, it's fairly consistent and averages about 125 feet wide and slightly over 100 feet high. And uh, so this is sketching on that day of discovery. And there's a big lead on the upper right hand wall above me there, uh, which we've gone back and climbed up into and surveyed later. Um, pretty big passage, but only goes about 500 feet before it shuts down. Short little video clip showing some of the borehole, uh, a lot of breakdown there. When you walk through here, uh, this is pretty well lit for taking video, but normally when you walk through here with your headlamp, uh, the trail kind of runs through the middle of this passage and the walls and the ceiling are so far away that um, they just kind of, it feels like you're walking outside. That's Hazel and Aria going through the, through the borehole. So at the end of that day, uh, we, we didn't get back to camp until four in the morning, uh, but we, sort of continued pushing uh, as long as time would allow. Uh, we were running out of batteries. I think we were running our headlamps on high because the passage was so big. And I know um, my headlamp, I was down to my last, my sort of backup of backup batteries, which I needed to get out of the cave with. Uh, we ran out of survey paper. We ran out of flagging tape. Uh, the camera battery died. 
sort of we ran out of every resource and it was there was every bit of evidence it was time to head back to camp and so we ended the survey here that blue and white striped flag behind John there is uh, what we used to mark leads and so we left a piece of that and that final station there the passage was um, 22 feet high and 115 feet wide and you can see the blackness behind us that was the lead we left and this we knew this was the last day of the expedition so we weren't weren't going to be able to come back at least until the next year so this was in may we uh, proposals are reviewed and approved on an annual basis so um, there's good and bad about this it was it kind of sucked to leave such a good lead but it was nice to have a whole year to kind of dream about what this thing would do Uh, sort of a, a map of what it looked like at the end of that first expedition. Um, you see the big borehole and the surface is shown on here too. I got um, surface elevations from Stan Allison, who was uh, in charge of the cave resources office at the time. And um, so we got um, elevations so that, so those that the surface there is to scale. You can see uh, a lot of the borehole passages roughly hundred feet high. And the surface is about 150 feet above the ceiling of the borehole passage. So we're getting fairly close to the surface. Um, the high point in Oz is actually uh, about, um, the high point is at an elevation of minus 17 feet. That's relative to the, uh, the datum, which is a, a brass benchmark that's at the entrance. Um, so it's, you know, it's something like 60 or 70 feet higher than the airlock. Um, is the high point in Oz, but where Oz is located is um, the on the surface. There's uh, there's a bit of a ridge, so the the surface is about 150 or 200 feet higher than where the entrance is located. So there is there's still some overburden, um, but there's a couple leads left out there. This is the, uh, the plan view, current plan view map. Uh, we've surveyed a little over three miles in in Oz, uh, and there's only a handful of leads left out there. Um, but I'm going to go through a few sort of better quality photos. So most of the photos I showed you there were from the um, original day of discovery. Uh, that was in 2012 and we did a big expedition in 2013 where we mapped al almost two miles uh, in a week. And then uh, we've had follow-up expeditions in 2016 and a couple other trips up there more recently. So we keep uh, adding to the footage. But this is the big borehole passage. Um, Thomas Schneider there on the left. Um, and uh, there's a traverse slope on the right, and that big funnel there drops down over 100 feet. That's where you come into the into the area. The uh, Ragonite tray that's in the passage just beyond the borehole. So these are some of the formation areas. This is an area called Cloud 10, um, photo by Max Wishak. Uh, one of the big soda straws that's out there, we measured this at right around 16 feet. Um, my understanding is that's not a record. Uh, there's a there's an 18 foot soda straw in Zion um, and there's another 16 footer in Oz um, in addition to this one, but I think the record is around 20 feet somewhere else in Lichigi. I'm not exactly sure where that is, but, but this one's pretty impressive. It sits right in the middle of the passage. Uh, some lily pads in, the, in this cloud 10 area. Some more shots of those lily pads. And in the back of Cloud 10, um, so the geology is a little different. You can see the, the Yates formation's got this very reddish brown um, corrosion residue on a lot of it and really contrasts with the white soda straws and stalactites that are back there. Really nice, um, nice with the contrast. James Wells in that Cloud 10 area. And there's a few pools back there that are quite pristine. Um, it's a little bit nerve wracking surveying back there. Um, obviously we're in full clean gear uh, for this area. So I mentioned that there's a few leads. Um, most of them are climbing leads and the two significant ones are, one's called the wizard and it's a 85 foot uh, hole in the uh, climb up to a hole in the ceiling in the big borehole and another dome that's uh, been distant at 200 feet. that's narrower and both of those are in that same Yates formation, which is pretty crappy rock to climb on. Uh, we've actually gone on expeditions with the goal of climbing these, and then we've got we've been distracted by other things. But uh, these climbs are they're probably low potential, but um, they need to be done. 
Uh, James talked a lot about how um, you, you all you hear about are clients that go to things. And I think our success rate is maybe one in eight or one in 10 technical climbs actually leads to something of significance. So it's, it's a game of numbers. You got to climb them all to find out though. Uh, we're a little terrified of climbing those two routes, by the way. So um, there's not been a huge urgency to get back there and do it. We're not too afraid of somebody coming and scooping us, but, um, but they're, they're out there to be done. So I'm going to transition and talk a little bit about Zion, which is a more recent discovery. Um, and it kind of, it's an area that's up above uh, Red Lakes, which was uh, the water source for an old camp that's been closed for a while now called the Far West Camp. Um, and I started drafting this area in 2010 and the, the sketch notes for Red Lakes was really, they were really poor. There had been four or five surveys and when you kind of take the notes and try to um, match them together, they don't look anything, you know, like the walls don't line up at all. And there were actually had been some resurveys out there that were even worse than the original surveys. So it was a bit of a mess. And so in 2013, when we returned primarily to go to Oz, we had three teams and we could really only logistically send two teams up to Oz each day. So the first day of that expedition in 2013, I sent a team out to Red Lakes. Uh, Stan Allison, Jason Blensky were on that team, Renee Ohms and Dan Austin. And uh, they went to the very top on this resurvey and, and were able to look through a small hole into a room beyond, but it was too tight to get through and blocked by uh, uh, like a drapery, like a small fin. And Dan Austin took a great interest in this and um, uh, put in proposals for the next three years to try to get approval to go back and uh, remove this fin and get into the room and survey it. And uh, he finally did get approval um, in 2016. And uh, he led a long day trip. I think that was about 20 hours in the cave um, and took uh, two teams out there um, it's pretty far out there. It's way out near the end of the Western borehole, uh, not as far as promised land, but um, it's uh, about the same distance as getting to like nor where Northern exposure is. If you listen to Art's talk and, uh, and John's talk where they talk about uh, uh, Zanzibar and promised land, it's, it's kind of where you would take off for there. It's about that kind of distance and to go all the way from the entrance is a pretty marathon trip. Um, but they serve, they, um, with approval from the cave resources office, they enlarged that hole, got in there and surveyed this really well decorated area. There's a uh, area Mildice in uh, the area they call Red Tides and uh, it's all flowstone floor. And they pretty well surveyed all of it with the exception of a climbing lead at the very back. And Dan reported that he thought the climbing lead looked great but the climb looked super difficult. And Kelly Mathis who was there said, he thought the climb looked easy, but the, the lead didn't look like it was worth pursuing. And uh, so it was only a couple months later in, in early 2017 that we got to go back um, and push that climb. This is a photo looking up at it. And uh, we were able to climb that pillar on the left and do a, a little bit of aid climbing at the top and uh, get up into that hole near the ceiling. It's about 70 feet. And uh, when you get up there, there's flowstone floor and continuing passage. And uh, we were able to uh, follow that a little ways. We had to come back on a second day and, and bring dirty gear for a, um, a dirty section that we had to change. Um, up to that point, all of this all of this is done in clean gear, aqua socks and clean clothes and so on. Um, and uh, uh, Kevin Manley, Ian Checkett, Ellen Will and I sort of pushed along a, a narrow, well-decorated um, fissure and Ian uh, was sort of scouting ahead and rigged a rope and went down a small hole in the floor, maybe only two feet in diameter and popped out into um, what we now call Zion. So this is where the rope drops down into Zion. Um, it's Blaise LaSalle on rope there and it's a pretty unusual discovery. It's uh, again two foot diameter hole in the ceiling of this massive room that's about 200 feet across and uh, just um, full of decoration. The whole floor is flowstone and there's giant draperies and columns everywhere. And I'll sort of flip through some photos of that. Uh, so, five minutes left. Thank you. So that's, that's Beth below some of the large drapery columns. These are, these columns are, these, they're actually, um, one's a column, I think one's a stalagmite. They're about 80 feet high. Um, and 
there's a little pool at the bottom. So yeah, there, there's a, one of those columns, um, Garrett Jorgensen looking up at it. So this is up towards the top of the Zion room, um, kind of looking back down towards the south. So not only is this an enormous passage and super well decorated, uh, it's also kind of heading off the edge of the map. So it's, it's not an internal lead, it's going away from known cave um, out near the western edge. Um, some, some of the shots of the spectacular formations out there. I've never been to Tower Place in the south, but the, these photos kind of remind me of uh, photos that I've seen of Tower Place, which um, from just based on photos, I think is one of the most spectacular places in the cave. Um, I think James showed some photos of these. These are on that space shot climb that's uh, 265 feet vertical that, that James and I did over three days. Um, just amazing draperies up there. There's some big shields and, and columns. This is Beth up near the top of the space shot climb. Uh, this is one of the climbs that we did. We, we brought a rope in the cave to do those climbs up in Oz that I mentioned that are still leads. And James took the rope all the way up there. And then the day he did that, we discovered this area. And then we went back up and got the rope and took it out here so we could do this climb instead, which was worth doing. Uh, Ellen Whittle with some of those draperies few pretties. There's kind of a map of the area. Uh, there are still a few leads. Uh, most of those are climbing leads. Um, they're sort of short, uh, short climbs, like little traverses or things like that, but they'll require technical climbing gear. So, um, and then there's a couple of really tight leads that nobody's too excited about. But um, as with all things in hypogene caves, like Lechuguia, you got to push all of these things to make sure. And sometimes it's the, those little things that sort of surprise you. So I have a little animated line plot here that shows you those two areas I just described. Uh, Zion and the yellow there, you can see it sort of juts off the southwest edge of the, the West Branch and Oz. And the kind of unique thing about Oz is how high up in the cave it is. It's, it's uh, back up to the entrance level. And uh, it is a pretty three-dimensional mazy cave, but um, there are some patterns that kind of emerge and there's definitely sort of a level of development up in the Yates Formation, and then a separate level of development down, um, you know, where the Western Borehole and, and that is. And then there's a um, couple, couple other levels in between. But uh, you can see uh, Zion goes up pretty high too. I think the high point in Zion is at about minus 400 feet. Um, so it's a, it climbs almost 600 feet above the Western Borehole, it's at least where you get to the top of space shot. Um, so last couple slides, um, if you want more details, there's an article in the May 2013 NSS News that John and I wrote about the discovery of Oz. And then in this month's NSS News, there's an article about the exploration of Zion that Dan Austin and I wrote. So if you want more details, you can go there. I wanna thank the photographers, I won't name them all, but um, excellent photographers and then um, make a little bit of a plug for my website. You can go to DerekBristol.com. Um, I do, uh, most people that know me know I do um, a lot of YouTube videos and uh, I started a website to try to help organize some of the content um, that's on my YouTube channel. And there's a section on projects in there and, and you can go to the New Mexico section. And if you go down, you can find more information than you probably care to look at. I think I have eight or nine videos on uh, Lechuguia Cave. There aren't too many people on private expeditions doing videos in the cave. And then I also have links to all my expedition reports. If you want to read in nauseating detail uh, what we do on a daily basis on an eight-day expedition, um, you can read through those reports. Most of them are in the 15 to 20 page range. There's a lot of photos in there as well, but um, it gives you a good sense for the kind of work that we do on these expeditions. All right, thank Probably you. Probably out of time, so thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. Wonderful photos, awesome exploration. Um, thanks for that presentation, Derek.